Hi, you're listening to the Stefan Levera podcast, a show about Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today, for episode 209, we're talking about Bitcoin culture, where it's going, and Bitcoin privacy tools with Samurai Wallet. But first, a message for the sponsors of the show. So swanbitcoin.com, the best place to auto stack your Bitcoin in the US with incredibly easy setup and low fees. I personally appreciate that Swan is Bitcoin only and is dedicated to Bitcoin education so your friends won't get confused. Go to swanbitcoin.com slash Libera to get $10 of free Bitcoin when you start stacking with Swan. And Swan has some news to share. They've had massive demand for daily buys since the day they launched the service. One of the big positives of regular recurring buys is smoothing out price volatility. So buying daily will catch those dips even better than buying weekly. There's a limited number of spots in the Swan Daily Buys beta, so head over to swanbitcoin.com slash daily buys to get into the beta. That's swanbitcoin.com slash daily buys. Next up is Knox, a Bitcoin custodian dedicated to ensuring their insurance protection covers the full value of their customers' assets. For example, suppose a fiduciary wants to hold $250 million of Bitcoin with Knox. Knox will seek to obtain $250 million of insurance dedicated exclusively to that account and adjustable to volatility. No fractional coverage or narrow scope. Insurance for what it's worth, a tool to transfer risk. Knox is backed by investors such as Fidelity Investments Canada, Initialized capital and inovia if you are a bitcoin company investment fund trust or family office check out nox for your insured custody the website is noxcustody.com and finally unchained capital bitcoin native financial services i really love the work unchained are doing to make multi-signature accessible and they're providing bitcoin products in a way that respects the not your keys not your coins ethos of bitcoin so if you're thinking about your bitcoin security why not consider going from zero to multi-sig with unchained They're offering a Vault Concierge onboarding package where you can have a guided setup call and have the hardware devices mailed out to you. So the prices range from $1,500 down, uh, depending on if you've already got some of the hardware wallets. Use the code LAVERA for a discount as well. They've also got the Bitcoin-backed loan product, and they've also got a range of interesting and educational content on their website. So go to unchained-capital.com. Here's the interview with Samurai Wallet. Samurai Wallet, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me again. Uh, am I? Is this a record? Am I the most frequented guest on the Lavera podcast? <laughs> You'd be up there. You're definitely up there. This is, I think, this is your fourth appearance. So I think there are some who there might be some who are up on five, but you're definitely okay. getting up right. there. So Samurai Wallet, I've seen you've been. Uh, well, obviously, there's been a bit of back and forward on Twitter with some of the recent comments. Firstly, in relation to you know the wasabi disclosure aspect of it and also some of your comments around Monero culture and uh, I wanted to jump into some of these discussions and play some of those discussions out for people so maybe let's just start with a little bit around what you see as what well, well, do you see any cultural issues in terms of Bitcoin users today yeah yeah absolutely I, I mean I've been talking about this since about 2015 it, in fact it's the whole reason why we started Samurai Wall we saw a the beginnings of a cultural degradation of of the space as more institutional money and and more uh, price driven uh, actors entered the space. When we had a huge uh, price increase, had a big driver retail investors, uh, and the ethos of the space was shifting as early as 2015. So so we were warning about that then, and uh, Samurai was a direct response to that. Samurai Wallet, the software. Um, and I think it's only exacerbated. It's only gotten it's only gotten worse, as, as far as I can tell, in terms of cultural acceptance of of things that even in 2015 wouldn't have been acceptable, such as closed source software and Bitcoin, such as custodial um, solutions being praised, all that sort of stuff. That's what I talk about. Let's bring that to today, then. So you're saying today, essentially, you're seeing this practice of custodial being seen as quote unquote, okay, and uh, closed source software. Do you view that then as people are making trade-offs to try and get further adoption? And essentially, that's why you are, you're anti that because, uh, and I think perhaps this is an area where you might want to comment also. I've seen you comment on this in saying mass adoption is the poison pill. Why do you say that? Well, that's exactly why you got, you hit the nail on the head. If you if you're coming into this solely as a way to to uh, increase your bags, as I like to say, um, as a way to as an investment, 
then then you have a different mindset and anything that threatens your investment becomes a problem to you and 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 privacy especially on the main chain to a lot of people they believe that threatens the their underlying investment in bitcoin uh and as such you have you see not only um a lack of desire to work on privacy features, which is just normal because it's always it's always a niche thing. It's a, it's always required, but it's always the it's a niche thing that people do. To being outright hostile towards privacy um, on on the main chain uh, because it's uh, you know they believe it, th- it threatens their investment. Um, so mass adoption is a poison pill because we're no Bitcoin's nowhere near ready to deal with that type of thing. Um, we should be years ahead in terms of privacy on the protocol layer before we can even start to think about mass adoption, uh, as far as I I can tell. So you were mentioning there around privacy tools, uh, well, privacy on chain. I noticed that yourself and some of the other Samurai Wallet guys, such as TDEV, the CTO, have been a little more skeptical of the idea of, let's say, some of the more protocol level privacy enhancements coming. So for example, if we were to get Taproot and then in future we were to get the uh, cross input signature aggregation, which would be a a future soft fork. So in your view, are you skeptical that those things will uh, come to Bitcoin? I'm not skeptical that they'll come to Bitcoin. I'm skeptical that they'll come to Bitcoin in a way that maximizes privacy. So we've already seen that with the cross sig aggregation initially it was originally part of one spec then it got broken out we'll, we'll do that later uh, and that's the part that provides the privacy benefit um uh, you know so i i mean you you would have to ask t dev exactly what his thoughts are because we are two different people contrary to what P, what twitter thinks we are <laughs> completely separate people um i agree with the overall sentiment that we are not going to see protocol level privacy changes anything that makes a real big impact on bitcoin i think that ship has sailed um the time for that was prior to the institutional money coming in uh getting that on the protocol level before they got in was kind of kind of the essential key to the to the whole operation um otherwise bitcoin basically runs the same risks as what happened to the internet uh which is total capture and the internet is totally captured, uh, with the exception of the fringes who are running, you know, uh, on the inser- uh, hidden servers on the dark net. Um, but for all intents and purposes, the internet as a decentralized network is completely captured and surveilled. Um, and we saw the same possibility with Bitcoin um, and the same, you know, we see we saw the same kind of thing start to play out with the Segwit 2x um, fork, and that's why it was such an important movement and such an important um, point to get across that the chain can't be and the protocol can't be captured so easily, or or shouldn't be able to be captured so easily, and that users have the final say. That's why that whole movement was such an important uh, important event, um, and and why it was so bullish. It was because it showed that okay. The same type of capture event that happened with the World Wide Web um, are still is still possible in Bitcoin, but it's not going to be as easy. Uh, and and here is our first first uh, show of force. Now the opponent wasn't very sophisticated, and the opponent wasn't very organized, and um, you know they made it kind of easy to for them to lose. Uh, if we had a much much more sophisticated opponent, a nation state, for example. Would would that still be the case, uh, and and would that still be, would that be the case in twenty twenty uh, versus uh, whenever whenever the two uh, two X fork which was, was two thousand eighteen or something? So those are all questions I think that are worth worth considering uh, as mass adoption uh, grows. I think the the likelihood of that type of event succeeding increases. I'm somewhere in the middle here, right? Like I obviously, I want tools like Samurai Wallet and privacy tools to exist. But I think I'm also of the view that most people coming into Bitcoin, maybe we could think of it this way, the amount of 
number go up demand versus the amount of privacy demand. And I, I think what we're going to see over time, well, even now and over the next few years, is we're going to see just vastly more number go up demand than privacy demand for Bitcoin. And so it becomes difficult then because it's like, it's not that people don't want privacy. It's just that that's not their priority, if you will. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, there's no there's no disagreement. Uh, people don't want privacy until they, they need privacy. And then they'll go, they'll go seek it out. And it might be too late for them in some cases because of their cavalier attitude to, towards it in the past. You know, uh, when I when I criticize the culture of, of Bitcoin, it's not necessarily just a Bitcoin culture, a cultural problem. It's a wider cultural problem. So uh, the problem with KYC is not a Bitcoin problem. That is a that's a global problem around the world. Um, you know, you have you have global task force uh, set up uh, across all the major economies that share data with each other. Um, and use and, and people are just completely fine with with um, handing over that information. And this is a relatively new innovation in the world. Uh, and and in the last twenty five years, it's been completely normalized. Now, when we criticize Bitcoin, because uh, Bitcoiners for for submitting to KYC uh, in order to acquire Bitcoin, it's not that we're trying to shame them. We're just trying to explain to them that they don't. They don't really understand the implications of what they're doing here. Bitcoin is a sub, it's a it's a subversive technology. It really is, and um, it can it can um, things can shift very very quickly as we've seen uh, in the first half of 2020. Things can change very rapidly, and you could go from from doing a, something completely legal, which is acquiring a Bitcoin, stacking Sats, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and that could go to illegal very quickly and your tax authority or your government or your whoever could ask you um what could target you very easily because you're re- you, you've submitted your name identity where to find you um your government issued id sometimes your passport uh, and a biometric photo in a lot of cases so you've you've handed all this over uh willingly and yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think the KYC um, issue in Bitcoin is is a bigger issue um, because of the nature of the technology. And I think that users coming in solely to, as an investment for a number go up have a different kind of incentive set. And uh, they don't, they probably don't care about all that sort of thing, but they might <laughs> very, very soon. Uh, depending on the shifting attitudes of this thing. And I don't think anything is is sure bet, really, in terms of the way governments perceive this and, and accept this. Of course. So it may come to that in terms of how private a person is when they first acquired Bitcoins. Obviously, nowadays, it's quite difficult to have uh, only non-KYC coins, although it is still possible if you, let's say, well, go to this, Bitcoin this could up. be being used well, more and more frequently, and that's a um, that's a decentralized exchange. Uh, so the volumes on there are growing rapidly, and there's no KYC requirement. So if you want to do, if you want K- non KYC Bitcoin, it's completely easy. It, not easy, but it's completely reasonable to do. You just have to do a little bit extra work. Yeah, with that point of view as well, I, I think it's also worthwhile talking about kind of realistically what happens. Also, right? So. I'll give you a quick example, right? So again, my intention here is not to like to FUD non-KYC trading. I, I, I want people to be able to do that. Um, but here in Australia, there was a case where I think it was like a 53-year-old lady in uh, in a suburb in Sydney where essentially the police came after her for doing non-KYC Bitcoin trading, basically. And now they were saying, okay, you're operating an illegal uh, virtual currency exchange without doing the KYC, et cetera. And that to me looks like it was probably an example. Again, I'm speculating a little bit because I don't know all the details, but it, a probable or likely scenario there is that lady was probably running a lot of volume through her bank account, the bank as in fiat volume, because obviously you know buying and selling. And then with 
a lot of those transaction monitoring rules in the bank that probably flagged it up to the Australian Federal Police or some other you know law enforcement agency like that. And then they probably ran a, a sting and then they caught her and went to her house and probably raided her hard drives and all of that. And so to me, it's sort of like, I want people to be able to have these non-KYC ways of interacting with Bitcoin, but it seems to me like somewhere at some point, unless you're staying under certain thresholds, that it's it, it may not be feasible for a, a big proportion of people to be able to do that. But what, what do you think? Well, I, I don't know the details of that case. Um, I know that in Australia, they'll the police will come harass you for not wearing a mask and for having a party in your own backyard. So, you know, I don't I don't know <laughs> that they're the, the best example of a of a reasonable <laughs> state. I mean, I I don't know what exactly the question is. you're asking me. Well, government what I'm makes just it hard at here to is... acquire Bitcoin, so therefore you should submit to the way the government wants you to acquire Bitcoin. Like, so what's the point? To me, you know, like I don't get it. Uh, I don't understand what the point of of buying Bitcoin is if if you have to give up so much information to acquire it. Uh, I certainly wouldn't do that. I don't see the the uh, the the appeal to that at all. Um, I think if you you should be acquiring Bitcoin in a way that doesn't expose you and you shouldn't break any laws to do that. And, and as far as I know, there are no laws uh, saying that you have to buy Bitcoin from a certain type of exchange, uh, whether that be in Australia or in the U.S. Um, now, in the U.S., what they use, that type of story I've heard for, and that's been this has been going on for years um, in the U.S., what they have to do is they have to get the the person who is involved in what they claim is an unlicensed money transmitting business to essentially admit to knowledge of a uh, source of funds being illegal. So they'll set up a sting operation with the, the local Bitcoin trader, for example, and then they'll they'll say something like, oh, yeah, I got these from, uh, you know, hacked, hacked uh, bank, uh, bank accounts or I got these from illicit um, drug purchases. And as soon as the trade is made with the knowledge that these came from allegedly illicit means, he's, he's, he's committed a crime and now he can be arrested. Um, and that's how, they, that's how they get him in the U.S. And they've been doing that since like 2012. Um, in, in Australia, I don't know the details of the law there, uh, you know, uh, but I'm not, I'm not entirely surprised. Uh, I, I, again, there's more of us than there are of them. They are making an example in, in all these cases. Uh, and I believe that people should resist and, and should should um, not not sacrifice their personally identifiable information to unknown third parties uh, just to be able to get in on what may be a good investment for them. Uh, that I don't understand. I see. Another common view uh, out there might be something like, well, yeah, of course, I might be able to try and buy some in a non-KYC way or earn in a non-KYC way, but they wouldn't be able to earn. They wouldn't be able to earn as much or buy as much if they had to do it all non-KYC. So, I guess in your view, then, is it that essentially you think it's worth paying the premium or having less of a stack to get non-KYC, or how, how would you frame that, or how would you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's always going to be a privacy premium. There always is with stuff. Um, you pay, you know, you pay more uh, for a privacy premium and, and you have to be okay with that. So, and again, it comes down to what I said earlier, where you don't, you don't know you need privacy until you need it. And when you need it, you're willing to pay the premium. It doesn't matter to you. It's just whether that, that's going to be too late. Like, so for instance, we get a lot of users who truly believe that by mixing their coins, they're erasing their KYC record, like that somehow mixing their, their, their Bitcoin after they've submitted KYC to an exchange breaks that trail of KYC. And it doesn't. And we have to explain this to users. So there's a big misconception of what, what's happening, the privacy of Bitcoin, where we get people who are thinking they're, get, they're, they're buying from Cash App, they're stacking sats, and then sending to their Samurai wallet, then mixing it, and then saying they're going to go uh, on the dark web with it. They're crazy. I guess then it also comes to what sort of culture and what, what you're looking to do with those coins. And 
I guess, yeah, bringing it back to what we were saying around how much number go up demand is there versus privacy demand, in my mind, that also brings in this point of whether over time privacy gets priced out on chain relative to all the people who want to stack or do something else with it. But uh, how, how are you thinking about that kind of idea of if, you know, fees were to, like a lot of people were to come into Bitcoin and would that basically make doing coin joins more expensive or how are you thinking about that? It will definitely, make, it would definitely make coin joins doing, uh, doing coin joins more expensive. Um, we, I mean, we've been hearing this for a long time, right? We've been, we've been hearing about how all these users are going to make fees go up um, and privacy is going to be priced off, uh, off chain. So we have to go to second layers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, we haven't seen it yet, right? Like the closest we got was Roger Veer's spam attack. Um, between 2017 and 2018. And that's when there was huge mempool congestion and the beginnings of a fee market starting to emerge. Uh, but it was all based on on spam and lies. Uh, and since then, you know, well, the mempool has been pretty much empty. Uh, we get we get small spikes every every now and then. Uh, and we've had the last couple of weeks, there's been a sustained small uh, kind of low level uh, non one sat kind of fee fee rate for a while. I don't think it's a, it's a huge concern for us right now. Right now, our coin joins are, are relatively small in, in size. We have five participants in a coin join, um, and and the way that the coin join is structured or the the transaction is structured, we have um, between two and three um, uh, free riders in there who aren't paying a minor fee. So the minor fee is paid uh, by uh, two or three premixers. And if we were to increase the size of the coin join to 10, that means the minor fee, uh, minor fee would be paid by uh, between more people. So it would actually go, the cost of a coin join would go down. Uh, so I think time is on our side. Um, we can deal with higher fees on, on chain. It's not really that big of a deal. And I think that, I think that while privacy isn't going to be focus of, of uh, core developers in, on the protocol layer, I think that they that they do have a focus on uh, transaction efficient, uh, efficiency, UTXO efficiency, um, and and I think we we'll, we still will see innovations on um, on the transaction side and keeping sizes down and keeping costs down. So I'm not. It's not something that we're we're, we're actively worried about. It's obviously an identified threat uh, if things get out of control, but um, it's not. You know, not not high on our list of, uh, of worries. I guess it could be seen like that's a bit of a longer term consideration and not one that's so important in the short to medium term. And it could also be that your customers, uh, the Samurai Wallet users, are the ones who are willing to pay that premium. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we want to keep we we want to keep things reasonable for them, right? We don't want them paying enormous minor fees just to mix because the the, the privacy premium. At a certain point, you know, you won't stomach it anymore. It will just be too expensive, and you'll look for other tools and solutions uh, to achieve the same goal. Uh, so, so I think that it's it's a long term, not even really a long term threat. It's just a long term consideration to keep in mind, uh, to keep an eye on. I, I, I'm not not worried about it in the short to medium term, and I think that um, there will be plenty of technological innovation both on the protocol level and within. A, our, our application level and our application stack where where we'll be able to to keep up with things and make sure um, that users are, are paying the least amount of minor fees that they have to pay and the least amount of coordinator fees that they have to pay uh, which I mean already already we do a, a good job at and I think both on minor fees and coordinator fees uh, we try to keep things we try to keep an eye on things yeah. And actually, while we're here, it might be a good point as well. I think this is a common confusion when people are looking at CoinJoin is they look at the fee and they think, oh, it's 5% of whatever amount I'm putting in. Can you just clarify for listeners who are maybe not so familiar with the Samurai Whirlpool model? What yeah. sort of fees can they expect to pay? Yeah, sure. So it's actually a flat fee model in Whirlpool. Um, 5% is kind of a misnomer. It's 5% of the denomination of the pool you choose so we have three pools we have the 0 0.01 btc pool we have the 0 0.05 btc pool and we have the 0 0.5 btc pool um, you can choose 
to put any of your UTXOs in any one of those pools. Um, and the fee that you, you pay is just based on which pool si which pool you choose, uh, the, regardless of what amount you put in. So you can, you can mix 1,000 BTC uh, in the 0 0.5 pool for the same price as mixing 1 BTC in the 0 0.5 pool. It doesn't, doesn't make any difference at all. In terms of your users, as I recall from our recent, uh, our most recent episode, you were talking about how, in some sense, you're designing the wallet for yourself, and the users are coming along for the ride with you. Uh, but uh, it, to some extent, as well, I guess your your software has a kind of target user in mind that you know they may be a dark net market user. Do you have any? Thoughts to share there in terms of who is like a typical profile? Who are the typical kinds of Samurai Wallet users? Well, it's it's kind of hard to say because we don't really know know our users. The only one, users we know are the ones that that make themselves known to us in our Telegram rooms or on Twitter and stuff like that. And it's such a wide ranging gambit that uh, you know I I found one one family that uses Samurai Wallet with two two daughters uh, between like ten and, and twelve that use Samurai Wallet a, a grand grandparent um we have very low low technical users and very high technical users um we haven't targeted the wallet to a specific type of user what we've tried to do is create a tool set within the wallet um that would be attractive to to bitcoin users in general and um bitcoin users who interact with bitcoin not just Bitcoin as an investment where they, they pop it on a hardware wallet and leave it there. Um, that's people who are interacting with, with the token, either spending it, transferring it, whirlpooling it, doing something with it. The tools that are in the wallet are, are essentially built from our experiences and out of necessity. And it's because they, they fill that, that same kind of need for a whole wide ranging group of people. I think that the people that end up the users that end up using Samurai regularly, they just require, whether it be, it, they just require, they want control of their UTXOs. They want control of their coins. And Samurai Wallet provides them a, an extraordinary amount of control of their coins, for especially for a mobile wallet. Um, it, 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 it provides them a lot more control than, than many uh, desktop wallets do, let alone other mobile wallets. So... Uh, I don't think it's an experience level thing, and I don't think it's a type of like hacker man type of thing uh, or dark net type of thing. I think it's just generally anyone who's interacted and used the Bitcoin token for any any amount of time will always will have something that says, "Man, I wish my wallet could do X, Y, Z," and it's very likely that Samurai Wallet can do that. Right, and yeah, I think uh, Samurai Wallet does, in my view, offer the best privacy available within Bitcoin today. Um, I think one thing that I've noticed as well from online discussion, and I think this can be a bit difficult for people because if they're following online discussion, it can seem like, oh, there's all this fighting going on and I might just ignore and just not even try to use any you know, coin join wallets and privacy wallets because it's just too confusing for them. Do you have any um, thoughts for listeners out there who are trying to make heads and tails of of this well i think that if you don't understand what you're doing then you you should probably not to use a feature right like you shouldn't just use a feature because your friends and everyone you you know your your influencers and whatever tell you to use it you should use it because you need it and you should use it because you uh, you should use it when you understand what it's doing uh so we try to explain to users and we try to explain to people what our tools do um, and, and what the actual outcomes of, of using the tool will be. Uh, we, we take great pains to explain these things uh, to people. Uh, it would be a lot easier just to kind of say, yes, you get privacy, um, as opposed to, yes, you get privacy, but you need to be aware of X, Y, Z, and and if you do this and this, you're going to undo what you what you've done, right? So that education that education gap is is kind of something hard uh, to to overcome. To that point you were making there, do you think that contributes to when people say things like, "Oh, Bitcoin is not private," 
because they saw some examples where someone was doing something the wrong way um, and that gives people the wrong impression that you can't be private using Bitcoin uh, when really they just don't know the right way to go about that. Yeah, I think there's a lot. There's a lot of that. Uh, I think that I mean it's a misnomer that Bitcoin is private. It's not. It's pseudonymous. Um, you know, because it's it is a public ledger. The idea always was that there was no personal identifiable information attached to your UTXOs, which is not the case anymore for a large number of UTXOs, as we were just discussing with the KYC problem. Um, but as a system, it was always assumed that it was uh, going to be a pseudonymous system. Uh, so getting users to understand that, getting users to understand that privacy on Bitcoin is a game of breaking heuristics and and breaking links and disrupting the movement of UTXOs or the flow of UTXOs. I think I think that's you know getting users to understand that is is one of the major challenges. Uh, and then the second thing is when there's when there's deeply flawed implementations of CoinJoin out there that are, are receiving hype and praise by influencers and regular people alike, um, it creates a, a problem for the technology as a whole uh, because it's assumed that all of the technology is flawed because of the one flawed implementation. I think that's the bigger, the bigger issue right now within the CoinJoin space. So essentially, it's, a, it's like the well is being poisoned by certain instances of uh, implementations of the idea and that may color people's perception uh, to make them believe that it's not possible, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, def- I mean, we're, we're seeing that already. So the, the, the narrative is CoinJoin is, is flawed and CoinJoin is broken. CoinJoin gets, gets your account flagged, et cetera, et cetera. None of this is true at all. Um, a flawed CoinJoin implementation is flawed. A flawed CoinJoin implementation is is broken and a flawed coin join implementation is resulting in people's exchange accounts getting closed uh, but that doesn't have anything to do with coin join it has to do with the flawed implementation of coin join uh, which is you know which is why we've been vocal about this thing why we we've been looking at, at not just wasabi but what join market and even the even chip mixer a custodial mixer because these are all in the realm of of what we're doing and what we're trying and, and what uh, of the technology we're trying to get users to to use and normalize and um you know we we what we would rather not have to not have to fight against internal actors who are who are you know harm as far as we see it harming the the space it'd be better to focus on hardening the space for external attacks there's also been some discussion around, you know, shitcoining and people talking about like, and I think, I think, I think some of this is kind of like, there's a bit of trollish mentioning of things like Monero and things like that. Um, although, as you've said, the wallet is Bitcoin only. Uh, I, I, what's spurring uh, the discussion around uh, the Monero, or the Monero culture, as opposed to just talking about Bitcoin privacy? I guess I don't, I don't really understand the, the question entirely. Uh, my tweet about well, Monero, well, my tweet when I mentioned Monero, wasn't it wasn't talking or praising Monero culture. It was criticizing Bitcoin culture. That was talking to Bitcoin users. My audience is Bitcoin users. I'm a Bitcoin user. <laughs> you know, um, I don't. I don't really know what else. You know, the the whole the whole accusations of shitcoinery or whatever. I think is so so absurd. It doesn't even really warrant a response. Uh, my my work speaks for itself. I mean, for God's sake. Of course, of course. Look, I, I think I I think I understand where you were coming from. As I as I read you, it was sort of like we are essentially not happy with the way culture is going in Bitcoin. Uh, but I think what what spurred some of that discussion was when you said I, I can't remember the exact wording. So correct me if I'm wrong. But I think you said something like. XMR is closer to our hearts or something like that. Yeah. And that was probably what spurred the discussion, right? Well, that's what that's what triggered people. It was it was it was the use of XMR and the fact that that it hit close to home, you know, uh, you know, custodial cucks and and sat stackers and and whatever else I said in that tweet. It was designed to trigger. <laughs> you know, you don't yeah, you should be offended. 
And if you're offended by that, you're probably one of the people I was targeting uh, and talking about. Uh, there is nothing really that controversial. <laughs> you know, I was, I was, I was, it was, a, it was a tweet against closed source software. It was a tweet against voluntarily KYCing yourself. It was a tweet against just blindless hopium shilling. And, and, you know, like these are pretty, these are pretty basic things. Uh, it doesn't seem that radical. Um, the, the shit coinery thing, I think is just a, a, just a new way to attack, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you can, <laughs> you can disregard what this person's saying because they're a shit coiner. It's a real, it's like kind of an SJW tactic. And, um, you know, I've never, I've never been partial to those types of things. And in fact, I'll call it out and I've never been shy about, about calling shit out. So, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop now. So, you know. I can. I, I don't mind being called a shit coiner, uh, if that's if that's what it is. Uh, as for Monero, look, the the whole point is when it, when something, it's, one, it's a small community, and they haven't had the the pressures that Bitcoin has had. Right? They haven't had a huge, huge retail movement into their space. They haven't had a huge uh, push of institutional money into their space. A lot of exchanges have haven't even added them to their their offering. Right? Like. It, it's a very insular and small community. And because of that, they've been able to retain the same kind of culture that was, that was present in Bitcoin. That's all I meant. Sure. And it's probably also fair to say that as you know, everything gets bigger, it just becomes harder to maintain that. And perhaps some of this also comes into this whole concept of eternal September, right? Or just, uh, you know, at, at the start, it's kind of the geeks and the fanatics. And then later, it's the mops and the sociopaths who turn up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, this is, again, this isn't a Bitcoin thing. This is a any any sort of um, subculture, any sort of group, anything. I, I was just talking uh, to the Monero guys on one of their uh, podcasts. Uh, I think it was Monero Space just recently and i was talking about you know i we see this happen in irc channels all the time anyone who was around for irc could watch the evolution of an irc channel uh you know evolve and then devolve <laughs> and we're just seeing we're just seeing that on a very massive scale uh so it's it's definitely something that was foreseen uh and expected the the debate um the debate is was more really about and, and you know, the anger and discontent is more about we were we ready for it? We knew it was going to happen, but we did, and we 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 were preparing for it. But did we did we prepare enough? And is the protocol is the protocol happy? Are we happy where the protocol is? Because it's not really going to be changing much from this point on, right? Um, and you get you start to get into that ossification stage of of, of a protocol. Uh, which is a good thing, but is it is it too early, uh, et cetera? All these questions come up as a as a result of the the adoption push, and it's still and 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 keep in mind, man, this is still that was a small adoption push overall, right? Like this is still a very niche niche thing uh, globally. Uh, we haven't seen a real big retail push into Bitcoin or crypto at all. Uh, so when that happens, we're still going to have a lot to deal with. And again, I think we're less ready now than we were in in 2018. Also, we have many users who might be using Samurai Wallet to send to an exchange. It might be useful now to talk about exchange flagging. So this has been occurring in relation to, uh, from my understanding, it has not occurred for Samurai Wallet or Join Market. It has only occurred in relation to Wasabi sends into an exchange or even in some cases withdrawal from an exchange so i guess some of this comes down to again uh the the proximity versus uh footprint stuff we were mentioning earlier i guess to your knowledge as well currently so far it is still that same case correct that is correct um we've had no reports of account closures uh, for samurai wallet users um we also test a variety of the, the biggest exchanges. Uh, we, just, we send directly from Postmix into the exchange account to see if there's any issues, if anything gets flagged. Um, there's been no issues. Nothing's got flagged on our own tests. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm very, very confident 
that exchanges are not flagging coin join transactions. There's no need to. Um, what they're looking for is proximity to uh, illicit activity or, or blacklisted addresses because that's what they have to be looking for. Um, if there's proximity to, to an address that, that they don't like the look of or that they are told not to like the look of, um, they'll shut down your account or they'll freeze your account. By, by its nature, a coin join should not leave any proximity to anything. Everything that comes out of a coin join should be zero proximity, zero links, uh, freshly, freshly minted, so to speak. Um, and that's, that's true of Whirlpool. And that's true of Join Market uh, for the most part. That's true of Join Market. It's not true of Wasabi. Um, and for a very, very long time, they had a static uh, fee address that polluted. Um, every single mix that every single uh, every single mix that occurred with that static fee addresses, because blacklisted addresses were paying that fee address, and that fee address was a part of every single mix. Um, secondly, unmixed change is a part of every mix of Wasabi, and unmixed change can be linked directly to a blacklisted address or a blacklisted transaction, and your mix UTXO. A Wasabi Mix UTXO is in the same exact transaction as a blacklisted address or blacklisted change address. So, I mean, it was obvious this was going to happen. We tried to warn people that this was going to happen. Um, we tried desperately, and then it started happening, and it started happening over and over again. And totally innocent users who have absolutely zero links to criminality, who have absolutely zero links to anything wrong, had their stuff shut down. Uh, not because they use CoinJoin, because they were sharing a transaction with a blacklisted address. Now, I don't agree with blacklisted addresses at all. Uh, I, I, I think the whole notion is revolting, but it is, the, it is the case, and exchanges are looking for them. So you have to build a tool that doesn't, you know, you know I called it taint as a service, Wasabi, because you were literally paying to get your UTXOs tainted. Yeah, and so with the exchanges... I think, and listeners, you probably, if you are a regular listener, you probably remember from my discussions with Raphael Jacobi, he was explaining as well, uh, essentially, the way he's explained it is kind of using that uh, saying, uh, they pretend to work and we pretend to pay them. And so I guess from an exchange point of view, some, for some of them, they feel like they have to do this minimum level. And so long as they are, in from their perspective, flagging incoming Bitcoins that had any association with a blacklisted address or let's say the OFAC sanctions list or things like that, they they can't so basically you can't rub it in their face that you they're you know, ticking that, boxes, but, right. Yeah. You know, they're they're ticking their boxes. They're not they're in compliance, right? As long as their legal team is happy, uh they're in compliance. And that's what that's what the chain analysis people are selling them. They're selling them compliance. They're saying, look, you don't have to worry about it. We'll do it for you. And we'll provide you a compliant report. We know we're compliant. Um, and you can be too. And all you have to do is pay us whatever, 8K a month or whatever it costs to, to um, join up with Chainalysis. And they'll, they'll do that. Uh, oh, condition being, you've got to share your data with us. You know, customer data. Uh, that happens. They'll never say it because they're under NDA. But it, we seen the contract. Uh, so, you know. The exchange just wants to make money, right? The exchange wants users and the exchange wants the least amount of friction possible because the least amount of friction means more money. Uh, they have to be compliant. So they'll, they'll go with whatever compliant solution that they can uh, that's easiest for them to implement and doesn't result in them losing too much money to, to loss users. Also touching on the earlier point around uh, Wasabi, probably also a good point here just to discuss around the recent disclosure there. So uh, I guess from your perspective, you've identified uh, this, um, well, there were two uh, crucial uh, points and you've disclosed them to Wasabi, uh, the team, uh, or maybe if you could just give uh, maybe just a high level of what, what, what were the two key points uh, just for listeners who might not have uh, read through that report? Yeah, sure. So, so we we're always looking at at um, other coin join implementations, whether it be Wasabi or Join Market 
um, specifically. Uh, we're always looking at these things. What we're specifically looking for is on-chain privacy stuff, right? We want to see how transa uh, transactions are uh, composed and whether we can we can figure out the links mathematically and whether we can break through them. And if so, how can how can we you know how can users what steps can users take and wallet developers take to prevent this from happening? Right, that's the kind of the whole point of OXT research. Uh, in in preparing a report for the upcoming um, uh, OXT research report on the Twitter hack, uh, we stumble across a different type of of issue in Wasabi uh, related to its code base, not towards its on chain footprint. So this is a completely different type of thing. Um, and what we found was that the way that the client uh, selects coins to be queued automatically, this has nothing to do with what the user does. The user unqueues un un a uh, UTXO, um, and then the client takes over from there on, on how it gets selected and which uh, um, which UTXOs to, to move and, and register for which mix. That all happens behind the scenes. Now, in that process behind the scenes, that should be a random process. There should be randomness introduced into that process, but there isn't at all. It's a completely deterministic process. So what this what, what ends up happening is if your um, attacker or your observer knows the state of your, your Wasabi wallet UTXO list, or at least partial the state of that UTXO list, they can determine which mixes you're going to be a part of and which out outputs you're going to be a part of as well. Uh, so effectively, there is no benefit to remixing in Wasabi because your mix is always as good as, your anon set is always as good as the anon set of your last mix. Uh, so if you get, a, let's say, a quote unquote, 50 anon set on your first mix and a 30 anon set on your second mix, your first mix is invalidated and your second mix is the one that, that remains. Uh, because there's no randomness introduced and your attacker can determine exactly which which UTXOs are yours in each mix. Um, this is obviously a huge problem. This isn't something that we would publicly disclose because uh, we, we considered this something that could easily be fixed by the Wasabi team and should easily be fixed. Um, and we really didn't think it was going to be a controversial thing. Uh, randomness is something that you want in a in, in a coin join implementation. You don't want it really anything deterministic at all. Um, so we, we we reached out to them privately um, about that. We made a couple conditions because we we've interacted with this team before. We're not on the best of terms, and we know they have a history of sweeping stuff under the rug. Um, so we added a condition to our disclosure to say, look, if you don't fix it in forty eight hours. Uh, then you have to tell users that there's there's been something found, and they should they should um, mitigate and, and provide the users a way to mitigate against it, whether that be don't remix or or whatever, or, or manually stop mixing and then restart mixing to add some randomness or whatever you want to um, tell users to do. You should tell them something if it can't be fixed in 48 hours. Um, instead of trying to fix it, or instead of even responding to us. They said that you that we were blackmailing them, and then Nopara released the full disclosure on Pastebin and on Reddit. Um, after he did that, we just said, "Okay, well, we'll write up our, you know, our report on it. Um, that's a little bit, hopefully, a little bit more digestible for average readers, um, because what we sent to what we sent to them was was really for." you know, the developers of privacy tools to the developers of privacy tools. It wasn't trying to explain things to uh, the average reader, you know? Yep. And so uh, as I saw some of the discussion, people were saying things like, oh, well, some of this could be mitigated by user uh, action. So for example, they could manually only queue some UTXOs at a time. Uh, and I guess the other one also, probably the one of the other pieces of feedback that I was seeing with people, people were saying, okay, but how likely is it that uh, some outside observer would know the state of your wallet and your UTXOs? Sure. Uh, in what sort of circumstances would you say that's not true? Would you say perhaps that if 
uh, let's say chain analysis of one of these companies is working with an exchange, the user has KYC'd with that exchange. If there is information sharing, how 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 feasible would you say that is? Very feasible. Um, so, it's, but just just first to answer the first the first response. So so we we waited and got all the so first Z, uh, the the creators of Wasabi Wallet never responded um, officially to us. Um, and have never really acknowledged that this even is a problem or or exists. Or if they have acknowledged it, it, it they've said that uh, that it, it can be it doesn't exist, but it can be re- fixed with uh, user added randomness. So it either exists or it doesn't exist. So if the user has to add random randomness, then it exists, right? If the issue if the, if if the issue can be solved, quote unquote, with best practices enforced by users. Uh, that's just not a satisfactory so you, uh, solution. That's not that's that's not good for users or for the coordinator as a service. Um, the coordinator should be enforcing best practices wherever it can, and shouldn't be relying on on users to to add randomness because uh, one users are are not computers and they're bad at randomness. Um, so it's, that's just absolutely ridiculous. Now the second point. Is, is actually more valid, right? So what is the the probability or what, what's the possibility of someone knowing the state of your your wallet? Well, in the default way that Wasabi works, it's very, and the way that it is suggested to be used by the developers and the community, it's very likely. Um, it's very, very likely that users of exchanges that where they are KYC'd and have data sharing agreements with Chainalysis and, and that's shared across the spectrum between other exchanges. Um, send a send a UTXO from exchange directly into Wasabi Wallet, and then on cue that that um, that UTXO and start mixing. Well, the exchange and by extension Chain Analysis know the contents of your wallet. They know that UTXO belonged to you and that went into Wasabi. And as soon as you enter into a mix, if they were deploying this attack, they would be able to to easily. Um, easily watch what you're doing, where that UTXO goes in, in each mix transaction. And the more you remix, it doesn't matter at all. Um, to me, that's what's the point of, of mixing <laughs> if, if your adversary can, can watch right through a, 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 to the other side? What's the point? You know, uh, what's the point of mixing if there's all these conditions? attached to it to say, yeah, I wouldn't use it for, I mean, there was the developer of Wasabi Wallet, one of the developers of Wasabi Wallet was on a, a podcast just, just yesterday or the day before, admitting that he wouldn't use it for anything like a darknet market or anything like that. Well, if they can't use it, what the hell's the point? You know, it's not like we're advertising for these people to use our uh, the coin joins or stuff like that, but wouldn't those people need it? Wouldn't they use it? If they can't use it, you know, is it really even worthwhile, right? Like if encryption only works for, uh, like email encryption only works for the good guys, quote unquote, what's the point, right? It has to work for everyone. Yeah, I think that's quite a powerful. And I think it, to me, it, it, seem, it, it, it all seems just very similar to a person's views on, say, gun control, right? Like if you view guns as a, a check against government, well, then you know, it needs to be available to a reasonable, like everyone, like it can't just be only, you know, for the government, let's say. Uh, and I think in a similar way, the use of Bitcoin and ideally the use of Bitcoin in a private manner, if the person chooses to, then it needs to be available for them. So I guess, yeah. I mean, that's how I'm, I see it. Well, I mean, um, if we want it to be any, any form of good money, then yeah, it has to be. Right now, it, I, my take is that the number go up, guys, the investment thesis for the investors is that Bitcoin has the possibility of being the best and hardest money, right? Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, no, it doesn't if, if it's not fungible. And fungibility comes with a lot of, a lot of nasty actors uh, uh, lurking on the sidelines, you know, they like with cash, right? It has to be fungible. Um, if it's not, then it's not good money. So, I think there's an intersection between the the you know the investment thesis as good money and the privacy people because we want the same thing in terms of fungi- fungibility. 
and it, if it's not, it, it, if it can't be used by the dregs of society and the most hated and most reviled people with the, the most awful views, if it can't be used by them, if they can't transact privately and freely, then what hope do you have of transacting privately and freely? Yeah, right. And I guess the only thing to me that seems a little difficult with that is it. I wonder how feasible it is for large wallets or large, you know, uh, basically any large wallet to use uh, some of these uh, coin join features and especially the, the on-chain fees required for that kind of thing, uh, where I guess to me it seems like if you want to be private at smaller amounts of money, it's easier to do that right now. Um, well, I, I don't know. It depends. It really, it really comes down to the source. Uh, once, once you've sourced Bitcoin, it's relatively easy to obtain forward looking privacy with our, with the tool set of Whirlpool and Postmic tools like stone walls and stowaways, et cetera, and upcoming stuff. Even, um, the, the amount is, is not really the amount of Bitcoin isn't really play into it. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's really about the backward looking privacy. Uh, how did you source that large amount? Did you, you know, did you KYC yourself to get it, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what, what third parties know about that, you know, and a lot more than you think. Yeah, I see. Okay. Let's put it this way. Whirlpool volumes are growing and it's, that's a good thing. I, I'm excited to see that. Um, but I suppose if you tried to move into Whirlpool right now with a huge stash, you wouldn't be able to because it, it kind of it depends on there being enough people uh, who are also trying to uh, move through the mixer, correct? Right, right, right. So, so we we definitely impose a lot of restrictions. Um, so, for example, if you had a single, let's say, like a single five hundred BTC UTXO, because we've seen this, we've seen five hundred BTC UTXOs come into Whirlpool. Um, it's not that that rare. Uh, you have a big 500 BTC, you go into the 05 pool. Uh, you're, you're basically, yeah, you're going to be waiting around um, for a while because you're you're that whale, right? Like we know you've come in on one UTXO and each one of those 0 0.5 UTXOs need to be queued up and mixed separately from each other. We do, we do not allow UTXOs uh, to be mixed together uh, that have been seen together before. So... So that's a self-imposed rule that improves the quality of the mix on chain. Um, so yeah, you're going to be waiting a, a little bit. That being said, the the amount of time you will be waiting has been what would have been three months ago. You've been waiting a month. Now might be a couple weeks, right? Like yeah. so, it it's growing every month. Um, and the available liquidity unspent within the pool is growing every month as well, which shows that the pool is very healthy, that people are remixing. And by people remixing, the anonymity set for everyone is, is increasing um, in the pool. So, you know, there's, there's trade-offs. It's not, it's not going to be extremely fast if you're coming in with a huge amount of Bitcoin. Um, but if you're coming in with a, well, you know, between... Whatever the smallest amount is, uh, zero one, which is what like a with a hundred dollars or something. If you're coming in with between a hundred dollars and I don't know, hundred thousand dollars, you're gonna mix pretty quick. You know, you're not gonna be waiting around that long. Yeah, and that's good to see. And I think uh, hopefully over time we see that build further and further. And um, I guess if a person is looking at you know looking on the blockchain and so on. Uh, I think this is one point, and we I think we touched on this last time we were chatting, uh, is that it's like there's this samurai cluster, if you will, that uh, as people come into it, they sort of become a part of a samurai cluster and it then becomes a bit harder to sort of uh, analyze inside of that. And so I guess, is it the case then that some of the chain surveillance companies essentially they sort of see the samurai cluster and just kind of leave it alone as long as it doesn't touch any of their blacklisted addresses. Is that the way you're thinking about it? Well, yeah, that's right. So we, we already know that uh, for at least one of the chain analysis companies, when they encounter the samurai cluster, it's not that they blacklist it or, or ignore or, or uh, avoid it. Uh, they just basically know that they can't make any reasonable assumptions with it. 
right? So if you're, if you're making a payment uh, to an exchange, for example, and it's coming from the Samurai cluster, quote unquote, which maybe it came out of a, a, a Stonewall X2 or a, a Cahoots or something like that, you don't, as an exchange, or as, as not the exchange, but as the chain analyst, uh, the analyst who, who, or software algorithm that's analyzing that, you know that whatever you think is probably not right. And it's as long as it doesn't hit those tick boxes of proximity to something blacklisted or, or some other thing, then it's better to just put a question mark next to it and move on because it's just an unknown. There's too many unknown variables in the mix and, you know, in the mix, so to speak. And, um, and, uh, when, you know, 70 to 80, probably even more like 90% of the transactions out there are deterministic and can easily be linked together. It makes more sense to focus on what can be linked with, with hundred percent probability or 90% probability or 70% probability, whatever. Uh, as opposed to, you know, the, the wildly varying probabilities of the samurai cluster. I see, yeah. And um, also, some of this turns on the idea that some of the coin join tools are there to actually try and break these heuristics. And so the idea is that the more these tools are used, the less reliable that heuristic is uh, over time. So obviously, it'll take time for that to build up and for that to really become a factor. Um, but for example, if a lot of people are using Stonewall or Stonewall X2, then it becomes a lot harder for a chain surveillance analyst to try and understand exactly what's going on when they look at a specific transaction. Uh, but I suppose one criticism there might be something like, well, fine, but what's the actual volume of Samurai users and how many of them are using these collaborative methods uh, and I, I suppose this is probably a good point to bring up uh soroban so can you tell us a little bit about that what is it and how does that help uh soroban oh well soroban sorry yeah yeah, yeah no, no no problem so so actually before before i talk about soroban maybe your users aren't aware but earlier in the year we we had a disclosure presented to us privately as well and the disclosure said that they that this person had found five thousand instances of address reuse within Postmix spends um, from from Samurai. So we took this obviously very seriously, and we launched a a, a very in depth um, investigation into Postmix spending uh, in Samurai Wallet. Uh, and what we found, well. Well, we found that the 5,000 instances of address reuse was completely bogus. It was actually, there was small, a small amount of address reuse, but it was nowhere near 5,000. It was about 200 instances. But we, we resolved that issue. But what I bring this up is because we did such an in-depth study that we know how many users as of whenever we wrote the disclosure was in July. We know how, how much um, activity post-mix spending uh, how much Postmix spending has been Stonewall X2s versus uh, single direct spends, for example. Um, so we have a pretty good um, good idea. So in July, when we when we did ran the numbers, um, twenty six percent of post all Postmix spends that have ever happened from the launch of Whirlpool, twenty six percent were Stonewall or Stonewall X2s, um, and nineteen percent were standard normal payment transactions. Well, we can't tell whether those are stowaways or just a normal, normal, you know, single party pair. Um, and then the rest basically were sweeps. So sending a specific UTXO with zero change back to the user. So we have an idea of how many people are interacting with the Postmix uh, tools. And it's very, very, uh, uh, compelling. We we're very impressed by that number. We thought it would be far less than 26%. We thought maybe it'd be like 15% or something like that. So so we know people are using uh, Stonewalls and Stonewall X2s, and they might be using stowaways. Now, this, now we can tie into Soroban, because what Soroban is, is a, um, it's a Tor-based encrypted communication layer. Um, and what this is going to allow for is for 
two clients, two samurai wallets to talk to each other uh, in an encrypted fashion over Tor. Um, and what they can say to each other is limited by your imagination, basically. The, what, this, what this communication layer unlocks is uh, so, many, so many valuable uh, uh, feature ideas and, and, and improvements. And also, um, because it's an app agnostic layer, has nothing really to do with Samurai Wallet. It's it's completely a independent uh, development. It can be implemented by by other projects who require a communications layer for their tool. Uh, so, for example, the biggest the biggest example would be Join Market, which right now uh, relies on IRC to communicate between clients. Well, Join Market could implement Soravon as a, as a communication layer and you know, a lot of the reliability issues and a lot of the latency issues would be solved uh, immediately. Uh, what we're doing with Soravon as our first, our first application is tying it into the communication process of our Stowaway and Stonewall X2 transactions. So right now, if you want to do a Stonewall X2 or a Stowaway, you have to basically go through like a four to five step process uh, where you're sending a QR code back and forth or sending a payload back and forth, or if you're in person, scanning four or five QR codes. Um, Soravon completely automates the procedure. So all you basically have to do is say, I want to do a Stonewall X2 with Stefan Levera and go. And it will basically happen in the background. And it's been, I think we clocked it at eight to 10 seconds uh, to complete. Uh, and that's with base, uh, zero interaction from the user. So it really abstracts away the entire uh, Stonewall X2 and Stowaway uh, process and, and creates a transaction that is very familiar, right? You put in an amount and you press, you press go and send and it kind of just happens. So that's a huge achievement and we're really excited to, to bring that in. And I think that's going to increase... Uh, significantly the amount of Stonewall X2s and stowaways. Yeah, it sounds really cool. So maybe just to clarify, so let's say, you know, you want to do a Soroban Kahoot style transaction with me. Would I have to have my wallet, like my phone on and the wallet open in order to do that? Or how, how would that, yeah, like yeah, how would that yeah. work? Right yeah. now, that's that's obviously a limitation. Um, there would have to be some sort of out-of-band communication. Like, so I would tell you, hey, let's do a, you want to do a Stonewall X2 with me? Uh, and you'd go, okay, and you would open your wallet. And provided your wallet's open, then we would be able to communicate. With, uh, ah, very of, cool. Yeah, and, and, and that's sort of, like, that's a version one, right? Like, by version three, that we might be able to have some sort of queuing system. We might be able to have, you know, a notification system to say, hey, uh, you know, uh, Samurai Wallet wants to make a, uh, a Stonewall X2. Do you want to accept it? And you can then you get that notification on your phone, and then you can open up Samurai and accept it, for example. So you know, uh, as but as a version one, yeah, you you both would need to be online. Gotcha. And so, how would the connection work there? Is it some kind of Paynim thing? Or how, how how does that part work? Uh, so the identity, yeah, we're we're using Paynims as the identity part of it. So I would I would know, I, I would have you in my Paynim list. Uh, not necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily have to have a connection active with you. I wouldn't have to pay the connection fee or anything like that. I just need you in my list. Um, and I would be able to say, uh, this is the person I want to I want to uh, Stonewall X2 with. Oh, that's pretty cool, man. Uh, I'm excited to see that because um, that I guess that makes it a lot more feasible because um, in practice, uh, you know, there have been times, obviously, I've been able to, sometimes I've been able to successfully get a Kahoot's transaction done, which is the Stonewall X2 or the Stowaway. But in other cases, I've tried to pass back and forward the, um, that, uh, what's it called, the QR or the uh, the payload. And there are times where it, it just kind of bugged out or it, or in some cases, it might be that I didn't, or my partner didn't have the the correct amount of UTXOs, or that it's something about the composition of their wallet didn't make sense for it. But I suppose, hopefully, if it's kind of like a more automated process, then that makes it a little bit easier for people who want to try these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so one one way that makes it easier is because you're not limited to manual transmission. If the UTXOs aren't available, it can immediately pop up and say, oh, no, sorry, can't do it because you don't have enough UTXOs. 
um, or the amount is too high or something like that. Uh, so we can interject earlier. And the, the other nice thing is that if there is some sort of failure, it can automatically retry without the user without the user having to do anything different. So it really it, it really should um, increase the the UX of the this functionality because you're absolutely right. Right now, it's still more you know you it's still more of a hobbyist feature, right? Like you need to you need to really want to want to achieve that uh, privacy gain. In order to 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 gain it, right? You have to really work for it in, in some sense. Whereas this is going to bring it to a wider audience where they don't really have to do much; they just have to know someone. I'm curious, then, is that a possibility? So obviously, the first round would be more, as you mentioned, having that uh, pay him for the identity. Would that mean in future you might collaborate with a totally random other samurai user that you don't even know? N- no. Uh... We don't want to necessarily do that. Uh, not for the not for the Stonewall X2 or the Stowaway. Um, the only reason we're not we're not doing that for for those for these features is because you are exposing AUTXO to this counterparty, right? So I would be saying, hey, I this Paynim or this me owns this UTXO. Would you like to you know swap it uh, swap it around? And you would say, yes, I own this UTXO. So you're, you're sharing knowledge of UTXOs with your counterpart. I see. Uh, so we wouldn't want to do that with just a totally random person. I um, see, yeah. But there's, but there's absolutely um, use cases um, for, for Sorabon where, where you can see, um, for example, multi-party TX0s. Uh, wow, so where you have cool. multiple TX0, multiple inputs of or sorry outputs of a tx0 belonging to different different people so you you can no longer assume that a tx0 from from whirlpool is one entity or one person i see yeah and that makes it a little bit easier as well because right now you you do have to be a little bit careful with your with your tx0 change or also known as doxic change um and if you were to send that in with some other incoming utxo then you might be linking things in a way that obviously you don't want to um so yeah. this might be a way to break that heuristic yeah well as this well. will break the heuristic right so as soon as we turn that feature on from that day forward you can no longer look at any tx0 and say this is this entity you would have to go this could be this entity but also other entities so yeah it's just a way of and, and it goes back to what i said earlier that Privacy on Bitcoin on a public chain is really about messing with heuristics and disrupting uh, flows of of inputs and outputs, and that's just an example of it. It's it's throwing in additional confusion. Yeah, so um, I guess just kind of summarizing the the flow, I guess just for listeners who maybe they're not as familiar with how it works. So let's say I guess in the ideal case you're running your own dojo, so you know you can buy a noddle or you can run a Ronin dojo. Uh, or my node has it also, or you can run vanilla dojo as well if you want to run that. And so then you would send some money into your samurai wallet. You would run that through a whirlpool to get the mixing benefit, and then you would, on the way out of that, you would want to do a Stonewall or a Stonewall X2 spend so that you are, you know, making every spend a coin join. Now, in that example, let's say the user has done that. Um, how often? Should they be like sweeping and running it back through the whirlpool from their post mix wallet? Uh, I, from you know different discussions I've had, some people have said, "Oh, you can do a few spends in that state and just keep using Stonewall or Stonewall X2, and then after a little bit of time, you should be sweeping some of that and then going back around through whirlpool and doing it for another you know rinse, if you will." Could you just articulate just for? us what's kind of a recommended flow there for you know privacy purposes sure uh good that's a great question um so so after you've whirlpooled after you've you've bought your bitcoin or, or got your bitcoin into samurai wallet you've added your your bitcoin to whirlpool and it's mixed my suggestion is to leave it in whirlpool while it remixes for free so you can leave whirlpool running and it will register for remixing Remixing is really important for your privacy and the privacy of everyone else in the pool. Um, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Uh, so until it's time for you to spend. Now, it depends on 
what you're doing when you spend. Now, there's two types that we've seen um, of spenders out of Whirlpool. One is they're spending on goods and services or products. Um, and the other type is they're spending to their cold storage. So they're going through Whirlpool, they're getting a couple of remixes, and then they want to move those UTXOs to their cold storage device. Um, so for the first set of users I'll talk about first. So for the people who are spending on goods and services, the change that, or the, the transaction that gets created when you spend uh, in, from Postmix will by default be a stone wall if it's possible. And it should be possible because it's, it's, it's usually uh, very easy to get stone wall transactions from Postmix because you have plenty of like size UTXOs. Uh, so it's it's usually uh, not a, not a problem. So provided that a stone wall is created and it will be by default, there's really no issue with with uh, continuing to use the wallet for postmix spending, provided that you can get stone walls. At, if at a certain point when you go to spend, you can no longer obtain a stone wall uh, transaction anymore, it's probably because. The, all the UTXOs that could be used together have been seen together and Stonewall won't trigger if that's the case. At that point, what you don't have to sweep it or anything, but at that point you can select that UTXO in the wallet and add it into Whirlpool again, into a fresh TX0 again, um, right directly from Postmix. So you don't have to sweep it back to account zero and then go into Whirlpool again. You can re-enter a new TX0 directly from the Postmix side. Um, and you should do that, like I said, when you can no longer create stone walls with your Postmix wallet. That's like the mixing to spend case. Yeah. And then how about now the mixing to cold storage case? Yeah, so mixing to cold storage is a little bit different. Um, I would, again, try to achieve some target of remixes, whether that be two, three, five, ten, 10, whatever. Depends on how long you want to leave the Bitcoin on in, in Whirlpool in the Samurai wallet. Um, once, the time gets, uh, once it's time to spend, what I, what I usually try to recommend is try to send the largest amount that you can while still triggering a Stonewall transaction to your, your cold storage address, your first cold storage address, right? Um, and that could be, let's say, uh, you have one Bitcoin in there in your post mix, and that's made up of various UTXOs or something like that. Um, you send, you're, you're able to, to send 0.5 BTC, right? Um, and still obtain a, a nice high entropy stone wall. Then what I would do is send that transaction. What you, what, what will end up happening is you'll have a nice 0.5 BTC on your cold storage, high entropy, because it's a stone wall transaction. And in your post mix, you'll have a 0.5, whatever BTC, uh, change output. It'll be the same amount. I would leave that there for a day, two days, three days, whatever, some amount of time, and then sweep that directly, that one UTXO directly into a new address on your cold storage wallet. Um, so the, the gist of it is try to attempt high entropy stonewall sends to your cold storage. And once you can't anymore, then directly single spend each UTXO over without linking them together. That's the best way for moving to cold storage. What you don't want to do, what you're trying to avoid doing is linking and merging all the UTXOs together that have that have been mixed into one transaction that has only one interpretation, which is all these UTXOs belong to one entity. And now this new entity, which is your cold storage device, has all these UTXOs. Now you haven't you haven't linked them to their premix activity but you've made it a lot easier for a targeted analyst to say, okay, we know the output is X, Y amount. So let's look for TX0 inputs of roughly that amount and start, you know, paring it down, right? Like, so it's just giving people, it's giving analysts and observers a, a cookie crumb to, to, um, to pick up and to, to use against you. And there's no need to do that if you can avoid it. I see. Also wanted to chat a little bit about Solomon. So you mentioned uh, this uh, in the prior episode as well. Is there anything uh, further you can share around Solomon and uh, you know what it is, what, how it's going to work? Yes, Solomon the, is our all-encompassing 
uh, coin selection algorithm and, and UTXO grading algorithm. It, it essentially um, it, it essentially gives a memory to the wallet, and it, it gives a memory to the wallet in the sense that it remembers what UTXOs were used for, and it automatically tags them, and it remembers um, what heuristics were were broken with different UTXOs, and then can start stacking different privacy heuristic busters on different UTXOs uh, or complementary UTXOs. Um, all of this happening behind the scenes and without the user manually needing to intervene and manually um, tag and and note notate stuff, which they can still do. Uh, we just don't need to re rely on users to do that. Uh, so Solomon basically takes all the different coin selection algorithms that are that are available in Samurai Wallet that have their own little fiefdoms right now and brings them all together into one one algorithm that can work together essentially uh so development is still progressing on that and it's going very well and we'll start to see i, I will start to see the first instances of solomon making making an appearance in samurai wallet very soon what's some, what are some examples of information that it could use uh in you know composing a transaction like how what, what sort of information can it take in well for example um it might prioritize using TX0 doxic change in stowaway transactions um, because that's a really that's a great way uh, to break the heuristic that a single participant is the um, is the owner of of the doxic change and when they make a simple transaction, they're obviously the same owner on the other end. But in fact, a stowaway transaction is two participants, so you don't know uh, who the actual entity is. So it's basically like, uh, like I said, it, it builds, uh, it will it be able to build on complementary heuristic clusters and know certain UTXOs should be prioritized for certain certain things. And um, the UTXO of a stone wall three or four hops down in the past maybe shouldn't be used as a UTXO in this transaction because that, that for an analyst would link the two things. So it's basically having like a, your own little chain analysis analyst in your, in your wallet. And it's all client side. It's nothing to do with OXT or our servers. It's all using uh, client side logic and uh, to, to remember and, and understand stuff. Yeah, very cool. And I guess these are just things that, you know, no human is going to be able to remember uh, which piece went to where and so on. So obviously, it's better to have the computer manage that for you. Definitely, definitely. Uh, you know, uh, for humans, you can do it, uh, but it has to be extremely targeted. And it takes a lot of time. And it's very frustrating, especially, especially when you start to encounter that samurai cluster, uh, you know, or you enter into Whirlpool or you enter into something like that, it just becomes very frustrating for a human to do having a computer do it there you know you know that the that chain analysis are doing that you know that they have computers and algorithms running all day we just want to give that power to users as well right we want to give them something to 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 match the weapons that are being used against them and and we think solomon is is a great step forward in that direction because it doesn't rely on the user knowing anything but it gives them it gives them uh, the power of of their wallet knowing, say, hey, you know, if I merge this UTXO with this UTXO, uh, I'll be undoing a Stonewall transaction five or six hops in the past. In the, you know, like that's that's epic um, because no user would be able really to go. Uh, no user is going to go and analyze their UTXO history five hops ago to make sure that this current transaction is gonna you know not screw anything up and and it's a real way for users to degrade their their privacy uh so so solomon should really account for a lot a uh, lot less of that happening and, and we're really excited about it cool uh and also uh samurai has sentinel which is a way to have essentially a watching only uh application what's uh, the plan with sentinel and sentinel x uh, so Sentinel X is just a is a uh, fork by the Sent uh, our developer uh, uh, Inverted X. Um, he was trying out some new UI stuff and some new uh, frameworks with Sentinel X, and uh, it's kind of just like a test bed 
Uh, Sentinel just received an update a couple days ago, and I think an update yesterday uh, to add in Dojo and Tor uh, support. And a very big update that has been in progress on, on Sentinel over the last uh, couple months, which is going to very much increase the um, offline mode functionality of Samurai Wallet. So it's going to be more of a, a complementary um, application than just a watch-only wallet. It's going to be more complementary to your Samurai Wallet, especially if you are relying on Samurai being in offline mode or in cold storage mode, or whatever you want to call it. Um, you want to uh, do um, PSPT type transactions, et cetera. All of that can be managed from, from Sentinel uh, in the next update. Uh, yeah, look, I think that's some um, really exciting stuff to see. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on um, before we uh, wrap it up? Well, and I think we covered all the, <laughs> all the big bases. Yeah, I think I think that about does it. I just I want to encourage people to to keep whirlpooling, uh, keep using the features. Uh, Whirlpool volume is increasing every day, and um, and the amount of mixes are are increasing. The throughput is increasing. So so people, the message is getting out there. People are using the the product, and I hope that that people are are achieving what they're setting out to uh, achieve in terms of of their on chain privacy. Uh, I hope they're getting that and they're happy that they're getting that with Whirlpool. Fantastic. So uh, just for listeners who don't know where to find you, where can they find you? Uh, you can find us at samuraiwallet.com. Uh, that's S-A-M-O-U-R-A-I, wallet.com. And the same on Twitter, Samurai Wallet. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks again. Hope you enjoyed that. And just a reminder, if you are enjoying the show, make sure you give it a review on iTunes or whatever podcatcher platform you listen on. And you can find the show notes and transcript at stefanlibera.com slash 209. Thanks, and I'll see you in the Citadels. 